All right, everybody. Thanks very much for coming on tonight. My name is David Ruff. We're going to be talking about Elton John today. Just bought a new unit in Toronto. Pretty cool to see us on the map with such a mega star around the world. Now, we're going to be talking a little bit about world events, what's happening with some of the banking stuff, how we're going to be making money and profiting from this. And we're going to be showing you where Elton John is just buying right now. He bought the penthouse. I'm pretty excited about it. All right, so let's jump into the stories of the day, you guys. Thanks very much for coming by. If we look at our first story for the day, Elton John, the legend, okay, he bought the penthouse in one of Toronto's most anticipated properties. So first of all, let's go back. Uh, this guy is awesome, been around forever. We really like him. So he's buying in King Toronto. King Toronto is the place. Now, this place is inspired by some mountains. Um, there's like four little towers. You can buy the penthouses at the very, very top that have uh, walk-arounds, a lot of luxury stuff. This is a very luxury, luxury building. Property prices start at $1.3 million and go to $5 million. Now, we're heading into a recession. I expect a lot of those prices to take some beatings, but let's see. The penthouse is known as the treehouse. And it boasts custom brass detailing, arched wine cellars, private tea rooms, ensuite tea rooms, custom libraries that span uh, two different floors. Wow, that's kind of crazy, right? And they have walkabouts, like huge balconies on all four sides. This is a luxury building. Now, if you look at Toronto, Toronto's very big. It takes you over an hour to drive across it. But when you look at the very, very downtown core part of it, now there's a whole bunch of neighborhoods down here. So King West is like where all the fashion district is, all where the restaurants are. This is a fantastic area, but it also has a second big award. It is almost exclusively 25 to 35 year old people. And it is one of the most active areas in real estate and why because when you are like 21 22 you're desperate to move there right it's like the center of everything but then as soon as you turn like 35 you get married maybe you have a kid you're like i gotta get out of this so the turnover in that area is very very high now elton john doesn't really care about the economy you know like he doesn't care he's got the money to spend on it so this type of property is amazing so let me show you what the outside looks like I think it's pretty cool myself. You guys let me know what you think. Uh, just go uh, onto Google Images and type in King Toronto. It's a set of glass cubes all stacked on top of each other and going less and less. And they're littered with trees and plants all over the entire thing. Really, really, really cool, I think. Um, so where is this? It is right on King West. If you type in the address, you can type in King Toronto if you want, uh, right on Google Maps. It's going to show you where it is. Uh, so it's near Portland kind of thing, Portland and King. That's where they're going to be building it. So that's just one block above Wellington. And you guys should know about Wellington. That's like Millionaire's Row right down there. Uh, very, very, very nice area. I mean, you, you couldn't pick a better area, uh, I don't think. Uh, amazing. Let me know what you guys think. If you like King Condos now, King Condos to live in or King Condos to invest in. Very different story, of course. Um, all right, you guys. So let's uh, continue on because that was the fun news of my day. So I, I like King West very, very much. Uh, Wellington, Millionaire's Row, some amazing condos there. Some of the best that you're going to see in the whole city. Of course, uh, that row is very, very nice. It's still, I don't think, comparable yet to what you would see up on Charles and in, in Yorkville area. They have some really luxury properties up there. Uh, it's, it's not coming quite to that level, but for the area, how can you beat the area? King West is amazing, right? But we generally see uh, a regular pattern in Toronto. Now this is gonna be the same no matter where you live, but when people come to the country, they're gonna move over to Spadina and QEW, right? Uh, into those uh, uh, city place, they're called kind of low end condos. Then they're going to grow up into their 20s. They're going to want to go to King West party 10 at uh, 25 to 35. Then they're going to go over to King East a little bit higher upscale restaurants. You know, they're going to be there around 35 to 40. 
then people want a little bit of space and they're going to move over into like Leslieville and then they're going to be there. And that's like young families over in Leslieville. And then if they continue to do well and they, they continue um, doing better in their businesses, they're going to end up moving up to Rosedale or they're going to move up to Forest Hill or something like that. And we see this pattern as they go through the city over and over and over again. If you're in my job, we're fortunate enough to see a lot of patterns and demographic shifts. So it's a lot of fun, I think. So New York, really, really cool. Uh, and, and this place, very, very cool. So you guys, uh, let's go on to my next story, you guys. Um, this one is going to be very interesting, I think. Uh, so go to Axios.com, Axios, A-X-I-O-S.com. If you'd like to check out Axios, it says cities push to convert deserted office buildings into housing. You guys, I've been telling you about this for several years because as buildings are not being put to their full use, imagine a, across from my office is a building by... Um, Sorry, what's it called? It's by Salesforce. Salesforce is getting rid of the whole building. They're leasing it. They don't own it, but they got to spend, I don't remember what it is, $8 million a year in a lease. Now they don't have to spend that kind of money. They can put it right to their bottom line. They're making just as much. So as people were working from home more and more, we don't need these downtown offices downtown. Now, this sounds easy to convert them into residential. It's a terrible job. But it's worth it. So why is it so terrible? Is because think about when you go into an office, that floor, how much space there is. And there's going to be a couple bathrooms per floor, maybe. Now imagine converting. The walls aren't the hard part. Now you got to put in fire alarms, uh, fire-resistant jib rock, plumbing for all those bathrooms, all those kitchens, all those washers and dryers. It is a massive retooling job. And governments understand that it's very, very expensive to do this. So they're giving all different types of credits in all different places. Let's take a look at some of the lists on that list. All right, again, so we're going to Axios.com. Cities and states across the country are looking to transform these vacant office buildings into housing as a solution to, for housing shortages. What they're saying, we need to recognize how we've evolved during the pandemic, says uh, the New York City guy, director of city planning. Uh, and he expects to recommend regulatory changes by the end of the year that would spur conversions of obsolete office buildings. This is very important. Now, I just did an article, uh, a video, you guys, um, a week ago or something like that about a building in Toronto. It was built in 1913, tallest building in the British Empire, and they are now converting it into condos. And they have to. They don't have the same amenities to compete with all the modern office buildings. It needs a new life. How happy am I, though, that it can have a new life? I think it's super, super co uh, cool. All right. So let's continue on, you guys. Um, this is the Axios article. It says, despite the fact that offices are only half full, these type of, of conversions have really uh, haven't yet really picked up steam. I, get, I think it's going to. I think it has to. They're expensive, uh, all the conversions I was talking about, and loads of red tape. Okay, but red tape is getting cut back. Notice as it continues, it's not just New York. Chicago this week just proposed to do the same thing. If we continue down, Los Angeles says they're going to be updating it. California is allocating $400 million in incentive grants. I don't know if you understand the implications of that. To give $400 million away of taxpayers, taxpayers' dollars, $400 million of taxpayer dollars to go into giving to developers to transform offices into units. This is big. And this is happening in city after city after city. And we're going to continue that. This is what I always said in the old days. It was always that people used to come to the city. Why? For jobs, maybe for schooling. But now that all of that is all done online, what we're left with is the culture of the city. Restaurants, sports teams, museums, all that stuff. The stuff that you like to do, that's fun to do. So we got to preserve that type of culture because after we lose that, there's no point of being in the city anymore if it's just rows of condos everywhere and nothing else. So the main driver is not just to come for work like it was in the old days. It is to come for quality of life. And uh, Now we're seeing a lot of seniors come to the city 
to be like on Hospital Alley, where there's a lot of hospitals, really, really good healthcare, world class healthcare. So there's different reasons to come to the city. All right, you guys, uh, let's continue. I think this is pretty awesome. Uh, so California, four hundred million dollars. That's crazy. And look at this. Washington D.C. wants to give a twenty-year tax abatement. Woo! Twenty years of a tax abatement. Crazy. So they're throwing throwing money at this all over the place. Look at this. Just in New York City, ten percent of the office buildings could give you fourteen thousand different residential units. Amazing, amazing. These guys. I love that they're forward thinking, and they can't just leave this to regular. Uh, companies just to do this. All right, you guys, uh, let's move on to another story. We're going to be checking out Toronto. So you can go look at this article at spacing.ca. Uh, I don't like these guys. I'm going to tell you why. But it says Toronto is a high rise rental city, unlike city council. So if we look at the map of Toronto, I, I'm uh, encouraging you on TikTok to go look at me um, on this on YouTube later. But if we look at the entire city as a whole, it's cut up into a bunch of wards. Uh, it looks like about 25 different wards. But each ward, each section of it will say what the ward number is and the percentage of people that live in each one of those wards. So... If we look at the downtown, downtown, right downtown core where my offices are, it's 58% and uh, 70% of people that live in that area are living inside of high rises. But come on, man. We don't have to be like um, Sherlock Holmes to figure this out. You, you've flown in on an airplane here or walked down the street and seen no sun because there's towers everywhere, right? Almost every city is the same way. The right downtown part is just a bunch of towers and all around the edge is a bunch of homes. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we head out. The uh, same as here is if you look at all the buildings um, from downtown on Young Street, Bay Street, uh, and then you start heading out past Bathurst and then over to Roncesvalles, you see the homes just get shorter and shorter until they're two levels. So this happens on every city. It's not just unique here, but uh, this is what's happening. Um, but this, I think this chart is really cool. So this is from the census from Statistic Canada in 2021, okay? Uh, 2021, this map is pretty cool. So if we look, of course, the downtown is, is pretty packed. Um, and you could go look up this article uh, on spacing.ca if you want. Uh, it's mentioning, though, they did this massive study on it. Okay, what's the study all about? Does it affect voting patterns? Well, I, I don't care. That doesn't, I don't know why they're spending so much money uh, trying to find that. And this is what really made me mad is the problem why so many people live in towers. The article goes on to say uh, it's, it's because of the makeup of the council, which is whiter and wealthier than Toronto as a whole. Okay, you guys, I, I, I'm kind of getting choked to death with all this stuff all the time. The reason why cities have condo towers is because of white people. I just don't understand why they hate. Why can't we all just all get along and all love each other? We don't have to drag this into every single conversation. Yes, all cities have towers. Uh, and yes, all cities have a lot of renters. We don't have to make it up about race all the time. We just got to love each other. Everyone, we're all going through tough times. Let's all try and get through together. Um, and so go to uh, spacing.ca and check out that uh, that map. I think it's pretty cool. Okay, you guys, let's go to the next article. The next article I wanted to show you is Central Banks of Israel, Norway, and Sweden. This is very, very, very important for everybody to pay attention to. Central banks of these massive countries, Israel, Norway, Sweden, team up to explore CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. And this is a project run by the Bank of International Settlements. Do, do people even know what this is? Because this is my opinion. I believe that if people understood what the bank, International Bank of Settlements is and what a CBDC is, they would have massive concern. They would be lining up down the streets and they would be protesting it. So imagine this, that we have the World Economic Forum at the top and the International Monetary Fund. And they're, they're giving counsel to the International Bank of Settlements. It is the central bank of central banks of the world. It is the bank of the planet, okay, right up here. So they dictate and give policy to all these other countries. So they're going to be trying it out on some of these smaller countries first, Israel, Norway, Sweden. And they're going to get going on this. Central bank digital currency. 
The problem is, is that money is traceable money, controllable money. Now, it's not to say we're not going conspiracy theory. We're not going to go down that road and say, what on, on hell's earth are they going to be doing with that, right? It's just the fact that they have the control to tell you what you're allowed to buy, what times you're allowed to buy, what cities you're allowed to buy in. Like they can control wherever you travel. And this isn't like science fiction. They do that in China today. And there's 90, 90 countries looking at in implementing this, including Canada, including the United States. Please look at the United States and what they're going to be pushing out next year. Fed now, F E D N O W, Fed now is coming next year. And it's the base layer, the payment rails for central bank digital currencies. Uh, this to me does not make me feel comfortable. I don't like it. So let's talk about the pros of central bank digital currencies. They don't have to print money anymore. There's no, no bills. Okay. Everything's going to be done right online. So that's really, really great. It's also very fast and very cheap. So if you got to send money somewhere, you know, to my mom or something, I don't have to pay a dollar to transfer it. It's all going to be like essentially free. Those are good things. But what's the bad things that come with it? Well, like what's the trade-off? The trade-off is like they do in China today. You can tell somebody they can't eat what whatever the thing is of the day, okay? So say that you're in Iran right now, and they're protesting in Iran, they could say you're not allowed to use it to pay internet or not allowed to use it to pay electricity. If you're in Canada, they're kind of going after farmers. You're not allowed to buy fertilizer with it. You're not allowed to plant as much stuff. You're not allowed to buy as much beef. You're not allowed to drive your car more than this many kilometers. It, whatever government, you know, they're all going to have their own agenda, but they can force it through not allowing your money to be spent in that way. I just don't like giving that control to anybody. I like being able to take a dollar and being able to go to the store and choose what I buy, you know? So that amount of control makes me uneasy. Now, will they put all of the conspiracy theory stuff right away? Probably not. It's probably going to be great in the beginning. Now, what do they normally do? It's kind of like that cook frog, right? Where they just keep on adding a few more things every year, a few more restrictions on it. So I don't think it's going to be one shot. I just feel uncomfortable about it. But if you feel comfortable, that's great. Uh, I'd like to know why you feel comfortable with it. And if you're not, I'd like to know why you're not comfortable with it as well. Now, uh, the last story I want to share with you for tonight is uh, a story that is out of the Bank of England. And this is what I think is going to be happening to Canada and the United States this uh, next year in 2023. Bank of Canada buys bonds in a bid to stop the, cr uh, the crisis. So what on earth does that mean? What does the Bank of England buys bonds in a bid to stop the crisis? What does this mean? It says the Bank of England launch, launched an emergency intervention. Please go look at this at uh, WSJ, wallstreetjournal.com. The Bank of England launched an emergency intervention to restore order to the bond market. Okay. Did you notice that? And then what does it go on to say? It's because of the government tax cuts. And it sent boring cost soaring and triggered a meltdown in complex financial instruments held by pension funds. So they, they need to buy bonds to stop the problems with pension funds. Now, you guys, we, we got to be smart and be able to put our big boy hats on here. We need to put our big boy hats on. Go to check out the article, Wall Street Journal. Why is the Bank of, of England printing bonds? So they elected in a new... A person, Liz Truss, she's a conservative. She knows the conservative playbook. Uh, think of the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher, or Ronald Reagan type policies. Okay, that's her policies. We're going to make tax cuts, give uh, tax cuts and incentives to companies to build more and get more jobs to get them going that way. This has been a tale as old time, 50 year old. Okay, it's the same playbook. But when she said there's going to be tax cuts, the entire economy went into meltdown. Stocks were dropping like crazy. The British pound is dropping like crazy. All kinds of damage in the markets. Okay, so in order to stop the markets, their main reasoning was because of the pensions. The pensions are monstrous. They have so many stocks in it. And a lot of people, they don't understand how it works because they're like, 
I hate this company, whatever company it is, enter blank, you know, I don't like BlackRock or whatever it is. Screw them. I hope they go bankrupt. But what they don't realize is the mutual funds that they own for their kids' education fund is in BlackRock. Their pension fund at their job or their school or wherever that, whatever it is, it's in BlackRock too. There's always a roundabout way that there's an unintended consequence that's going to come and bite you. And because they're the so large, they're the ones most at risk. So because the pension funds were in trouble in Europe, in England, and prices are dropping, they went to print bonds, which means print money. <laughs> so the entire, the entire budget is to reduce inflation, yet they're going to have to create inflation to battle the problem <laughs> of inflation. <laughs> are we even on the same planet here? Anyway. This just drives me crazy. I don't I don't understand how everyone doesn't see that. But you know what? I just encourage you guys all to read a lot of books. So this is where I think Canada and the United States are going. Our pensions in Canada and the United States are massive. They're like the size of a planet. And so they're going to get hurt really, really bad as these stock markets are going down. So what does that mean? That means that they're going to most likely go down the path of if, what England is doing and buying more bonds, printing money. So as they do that, it's going to create even more inflation. This is what I think. I'm going to put it, put it out there and you guys let me know what you think. I think that inflation is going to be very sticky. Inflation is going to be here for 10, not 10 years, maybe five years, 10, 15%, something like that per year for five years. What does that work out to be? You know, that could be 50% inflation over time. I think we're heading into a really, really rough time. There's no way that any government can put the interest rate above where uh, inflation is right now. So if inflation is running at 9%, do you think they're going to put the, the rate out at 11? There's no way. I don't I don't see it. I don't think it's possible. Listen, I still think there's a 5% chance it could happen, but I don't see it. But let me see let me know what you think. If you think the rate's going to go that high or not. Otherwise, then inflation is going to be pretty sticky. It's going to be sticking around for a long time. I think it's going to be here for a while. So what does that mean if inflation continues up? This is the crazy part. I was talking to somebody just earlier today. He had bought a house. Think of these numbers. 170,000. And he said, do you know what? The interest rate was at 5% at the time. Okay. So the, the home price went up because interest rates went to 1%. And now home prices are coming down back to around 5%. So ironically, what would that mean? If we were just thinking, it'd mean the home could drop down to 170,000 again, because that's what it was before. 100,000, 170,000 for 5%. It theoretically could go to 170,000 for 5% again, right? Not quite, because we printed another 50% more money. The government has. So the volume of money makes a difference. So if you took 170,000 and added 50% to it, right, we'd be getting close to the real number. But that still leaves room for the prices to fall. Uh, so I think there's going to be some serious, serious uh, effects of this. So I always am telling people, when did they start printing money? immediately when the health crisis started, okay? Like April, 2020, they started printing money. When did they start complaining about inflation? Eh, a year later, they were like, oh, maybe it's here, maybe it's not. It, it could be transitory, don't worry, it's not a problem. But then they said in 2022, this year, oh my goodness, inflation is crazy. Okay, so when they started printing money at this astronomical rate, it took a minimum of one year for anyone to feel anything and two years before they were really panicking. So the same is in reverse. It takes time. When they raise the interest rate this much, we're only like, what, six months into interest rate raise? Okay, it takes time for it to really come. You're not going to see the real effects for, again, between a year and two years. If they leave the rate at 5% for this long, that's going to be the difference. Everyone's asking me, how high is it going to go? Wrong question. You got to ask, how long will it stay high? Because if interest rates went to... 10% for a week, nobody would care and drop back down. Everyone would just wouldn't buy a home that week. They would just wait it out, right? It's if the rates go up and stay high for a long period of time, man, a wrecking ball. So it's how long? And they're probably going to stick around for a while. I expect it to go up to 5%. They'll probably sometime next year, if the economy gets really bad, start doing cuts. But I don't see it going back down to zero where it was before. They'll start, stop raising and maybe make some small cuts next spring, but let's see where it goes. Uh, things are always changing. We are looking at a very bad year for food. Canada has come through for the planet. 
We are having bumper crops this year. Really good crops. So we're really happy. We're halfway through the season. Let's hope the rest of the season, you guys, that we have a good season, man. We don't want the world to go hungry. We are seeing massive price increases everywhere. So stock up where you can. Make sure that you have enough stuff at your home at, uh, for your own. If you have a big home, it's probably time to sell your home. If you have a small home, that is great. Try not to get into too much debt right now. Some of the best deals of your life are going to be coming up later on. So if you want to buy homes, there's still some really, really good deals out there. But we're talking about buying smaller homes in high demand areas. That's what you need. Smaller homes, high demand areas, great buys right now. But if you have a large home, that's the ones that you got to like really look out at. Uh, I was just looking at one this morning it's up for sale for 875,000. It was 1.3 million last year. 1.3 million down to 875. That's a big drop. Even bigger, Toronto, it was in the news today, had a home that dropped its price by 5 million. Yeah, it went from like 19 down to 13 or something like that. I don't remember what it was. It dropped like 5 million bucks. Um that was on the news, but you know, that's why I keep saying the bigger they are, the harder they fall, right? You need entry-level homes. I think you're going to be okay with something like that. Uh, if you're looking at buy, buying or selling any properties, we operate all over the greater Toronto area. You can book a free consult with me uh, online. Um, and that's about it. Now, we're going to be uh, releasing some books and some courses later on um, in October. So if it's something that interests you, you can email me, contact at Rough Team Realty. And uh, just write book in the subject line. If you're looking at one of our courses, you can also just write course in the subject line. Contact that rough team realty. Anyway, I want you guys to crush it. Keep doing well. Keep pushing. Keep learning. Try and read one book a week. Try to be 1% better every week. Every day is too much. But even if you could do 1% per week, you're going to be doing a lot better for yourself. I promise you. Keep making money. Keep crushing it. I love you. And I'm there for you. Okay. So if you have any questions, email me. Contact at Rough Team Realty. I'll see if I can help you out in any way. Please remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. It really helps the channel. We want the channel to grow more. We're really trying to help more people as we go through this. Toronto is an awesome city. I love living here. been living here a long time. Now Elton John is moving in here. Makes me uh, even happier. Hopefully, we'll run across them in the street. All right. I wish you the very, very best, you guys. Have a great night. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much for sticking around. If you like that video, you might like this one and maybe something like that.